Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Dami. I'm a licensed architect in Vancouver, BC. In this video, we're going to talk about how long it takes to become a licensed architect in North America. We're going to talk about all the steps that you need to take and what it actually means to be a licensed architect. <laughs> I'm not gonna sugarcoat it guys. It takes a friggin' long ass time. I just got registered and it has been my 10th year in architecture and um, I'm one of the people who got registered very, very early. So uh, it's something to keep in mind. Okay, so what are the steps? So first you need to go to architecture school and then you need to finish your internships and then you need to take your licensing exams. First and foremost, you go to architecture school. You need to make sure that it is a NAAB or CACB accredited university. If it's not an accredited university, you could spend four years going to school and it still won't count towards your licensure. So you actually can't use that to become a licensed architect. Some schools have a accredited bachelor's program and some schools have an accredited master's program. So what that means is that if you go to a bachelor's program that is accredited, which is usually five years, then that means that you can start your internship process even without going to a master's program. So that's to keep in mind. But I have also heard of people just going in and doing their masters anyways. In fact, um, one of the guests on my channel, Evelyn, I'll leave the link up here. Um, she decided to go in and do her masters anyways because she wanted more of that theoretical knowledge. If you decide to do a bachelor's and a master's, um, bachelor's will be typically four years um, and then a master's will be typically anywhere between two to four years. If you did go to a bachelor of architecture, then typically you can do a shorter master's degree. Um, if you did a non-architectural bachelor's, then your master's will be, well, it'll take a little bit longer. So I did a bachelor's of architecture and then a master's of architecture. So um, I did a total of six years of school and I took a one year break in between to work at an architecture office. So that was seven years before I started my internship. So as soon as you graduate from school, you can register for the internship program and you can start collecting hours. So the internship program is basically 3,720 hours of work under the supervision of a licensed architect where you basically learn all the things that you need to learn that they don't really teach you in school um, on how to become a fully functioning architect. So the hours are broken up into these categories, programming, site analysis, schematic design, engineering systems coordination, building cost analysis, code research, design development, construction documents, specifications and material research, Research, document checking and coordination, bidding and contract negotiation, construction phase, office, construction phase, site, project management, office management. Depending on what kind of firm you're in, you might have a kind of hard time collecting hours in some of these categories. Um, for example, a fresh grad out of school will probably get put into the design development phase, which is uh, doing the design renderings, doing the diagrams, um, because that's the type of skill that you're really good at um, just right out of school. And you might have a hard time collecting, for example, bidding and negotiation hours or site hours. So you really have to make sure that you are taking responsibility over your own hours because nobody's gonna do that for you. Um, it's not profitable for a company to put 
uh, someone in a uh, contract negotiation phase when they've never done that before. So you really have to be your own champion and go and ask your boss to put you in those phases um, so that you can collect those hours. For me, I had a hard time collecting the bidding and negotiation hours. So my company basically put me on another project that was going through bidding and negotiations um, and I was able to collect hours that way. I have also met people who had to move firms. And so you really have to make that judgment call. Like if you don't think you can wait around for a company to bring a project to that phase, then you have to be creative and see how else you can collect those hours. This is why when you're having your interviews, it's also important to ask these questions on um, like how they accommodate the internship process. Um, I know that when you just come out of school, it's very tempting to take the first offer that comes at you. Um, but I feel like this will be better for the long run if you just um, ask them how they work with interns. How do they make sure that the interns get hours as fast as possible? And, you know, if they don't have those processes in place, then maybe um, it's not the best place for you. One last thing to say about that is as soon as you apply for the internship program, just make sure that you're categorizing all your hours and um, just creating a system where you can collect those hours easily on an Excel sheet or whatever program you want to use um, because you don't want any of those hours to go to waste. I started my internship pretty much right after I finished my master's and it took me three years to finish my internship. Um, but this really depends on what type of firm you're at um, and it can take anywhere between three to however long you decide to take it to. I've seen people um, not get licensed for decades. And then there's the examination process. So there's the nationwide exams, and then there's the requirements of your local jurisdiction. In the States, they're called the AREs, and in Canada, they're called the exacts. Canadian architects have the option to take the AREs instead if they want to. Uh, you need to meet certain requirements for you to be able to write these exams, and it varies by jurisdiction, but here in BC, you need to have completed 2,800 hours for you to be eligible to write the exams. So these exams, in a nutshell, test you on your ability to design safe and healthy buildings. And they also test you on your ability to manage projects and to coordinate your consultants. They cover all of these topics. If you want me to talk about any of these topics more in depth, I uh, just leave a comment below and um, I'd be happy to do that. The main difference between um, the AREs and the exacts is that the AREs are broken up into five different exams, uh, one exam per topic, and the exacts are, um, all the topics are combined um, into tests that are taken over a period of two days. So with the AREs, if you fail in one of the categories, you have the option to take it again because the tests run at uh, multiple times of the year at different testing facilities. Um, but the exacts, it only happens once a year in November. So if you fail uh, one of the categories, you will have to wait one more year um, to take that again. So this will have an impact on your study schedule. Um, I decided to do the exacts because I just wanted to study all together and just get it over with. And yeah, I ended up sacrificing my entire summer and my birthday because of it, but I think it was worth it. All in all, I think it's best for you to just go and take these exams and get it over with. Just do it as soon as you can and just rip off the band-aid because the longer you wait, you're gonna get older, you're gonna have more commitments and it's gonna be harder for you to commit like months and months to studying. So um, my advice would be to do them as fast as possible. So in the end, 
the fastest you can get your license is in nine years. Nine years is a big chunk out of your life. So that is something that you should take into consideration if you are thinking of becoming an architect. So what does it mean to be a licensed architect? Being a licensed architect isn't really about uh, your ability to draw well or design well, although that supplements your skill. The main difference between a licensed architect versus an intern architect or a project manager is the legal responsibility. So when you sign and seal the drawings, you're basically providing your professional assurance, which is legally bound, and you're saying, yes, this design meets all the standards in terms of life safety and accessibility. I have gone and reviewed the code and all the standards of the jurisdiction to make sure of that. And that's why when you put in a permit to the city, you have the engineer stamps and you have the architect stamps. And that's basically providing your legally binding professional assurance saying that, yes, we have checked all of these drawings and reviewed them to the best of our abilities because someone at the city isn't gonna have the expertise to check all of the numbers and make sure that everything is correct. So the liability is not on them if something goes wrong with the building. Another responsibility of the architect is to coordinate all the engineers on the project. On a typical project, you will have a structural engineer, you'll have a electrical engineer, you'll have a mechanical engineer. And so your role as the, it's called a CRP, a coordinating registered professional is to make sure that the mechanical system doesn't collide with the electrical system and that they work well together and that they work along with the design intent of the project. And so when you stamp those drawings, you're giving your written promise to the city and to the public saying that, yes, I have reviewed all of the standards and I have coordinated these other professionals. And so what all of that means is that you can get sued. And of course, I'm not saying this to deter you guys, but I mean, this is something that I've had drilled into my head when I was going through the process. So I just think it's good for you to know earlier than later. If the window starts leaking, you could get sued. If the roof falls apart, you could get sued. If the structural engineer makes a mistake on one of his calculations, sued. If a drunk frat boy opens the balcony window and falls off the balcony, you could get sued. But there are a lot of systems in place to protect us, like the liability insurance. So um, you don't have to worry too much. You can also get licensed and if you don't want to take the responsibility of stamping the drawings, um, you don't have to. You can work for a firm where they have architects who stamp the drawings. It's not at all that you have to start stamping drawings and start taking all of this legal responsibility as soon as you get licensed. And so all of this here is why the term architect is very protected. If you call yourself an architect and you haven't fully gone through the process, then you get into a lot of trouble. I have a friend who is a registered architect in the Czech Republic, um, but she is an intern architect here. And she had on her couch surfing profile that she was an architect. <laughs> and uh, the AIBC, which is the governing body of architects here in BC, they basically contacted her and they <laughs> gave her a red flag. I know that a lot of other places in the world, the term architect is used very loosely. So um, whenever somebody calls themselves an architect, you just want to make sure to check where they got registered, where they're from, check their credentials, um, because it could really mean a lot of different things based on where you are and where you come from. If you found this video helpful, or if you have any questions, uh, just leave it in the comments below and I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. If you found this video helpful, please give me a thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed already, I will be making more videos like this. Um, so please subscribe and I will see you in the next video.